Hey guys, well, thank you for joining. Uh, this is our second episode of Bluefin Backstage. And today we're going to be talking about the rule engine. And really the rule engine, we'll kind of get into the details, but this is our way of driving validations and adjustments to our user interface within our vessel application. And so to back up a little bit, uh, we are Bluefin Data, and really what we strive to do here is we strive to be the source of truth for decisions that impact the people and planet. And really this, this comes down to data collection that is used by decision makers uh, to help guide their decisions and make sure that we're using best available science to impact or make an impact. Uh, we were officially founded in 2006, and actually by my father, Claude Peterson. And our, our business model back then was to build a single application per client, or in this case, like per fishery, where each agency that came to us said, here are the requirements, uh, we'd build out an application, and then we'd move on to the next uh, client or fishery, and then build out a second application and keep going down that rabbit hole. And really around 2012, 2013 is when we realized that we needed to make a pivotal change to a centralized application that could be used for data collection, really for multiple agencies and multiple fisheries. And today the system is called Vessel that we will get into. And today, uh, I guess jump forward to, to now, electronic reporting or data collection is pretty much a standard. Uh, and so now that we have that standard in place, we're looking to leverage Vessel to expand into other uses, usages or usage. One example being collecting information about mammal interactions or other interactions while somebody is also already having to use Vessel to satisfy their uh, reporting requirements. And so today I will be your presenter. I'm Andrew Peterson, and I'm the CEO of Open Data. Um, here's my family for our Christmas photo of, of the year. Um, some of you have might have seen my my daughter running around in the back of some of the meetings I'm on. Um, and I my career really started back in high school whenever I just had some miscellaneous jobs that I ended up quitting and. Uh, becoming a uh, professional poker player. And I, my, my mother wasn't too happy whenever I told her I was going to be a professional gambler, but I did end up doing it for five years and she wasn't too uh, stressed out about it towards the end there. But she was happy once I got out. Um, <laughs> and I joined Bluefin Data in 2010. Uh, I started out at, as just a basic support, I guess in a basic support role just to understand the business and, and what we did. And that kind of ignited a desire to become a developer and understand how to program, which then evolved into project management and now more on the business side of things as the CEO. And of course, uh, we have a, a team behind us uh, now. Um, back whenever I started, it was just my father and I, uh, but I've slowly started hiring people to to fill in and to be honest, a lot of these guys do a much better job at, at the jobs I used to do. But uh, we are a team of seven. Uh, we have uh, Brett Pierce, who is our, our senior project analyst. Um, he took on a lot of the project management. So a lot of you guys are working with Brett to understand what the requirements are and then hand those requirements over to the, the guys up towards the right of the slide. Um, to actually implement those requirements. And so James Sampson is our CIO. He, he essentially is the architect behind everything uh, that we build. And he, he really knows all the ins and outs of Vessel, um, any legacy application that we have. And he, he is the, I guess, the one drawing out the roadmap between what agencies need and what the system needs to provide. And then CJ is one of our uh, software developers helping James and Paul uh, implement the system. And uh, on the fur furthest right is Tony, who many of you have talked with on, on the phone, handling our support and uh, doing our quality assurance for Vessel. And so what is Bluefin Backstage? This, was, this is a somewhat new idea 
of us giving presentations on various topics. Um, typically, we're, we're trying to stick to like a every month or two month uh, range. And really, this is our way of becoming, I guess, increasing our transparency on how we operate, why we operate. Um, we're trying to, I guess, spark conversations between us, between clients, uh, the various regions, just to get a better understanding of what the needs are. And then also to help be able to provide information that might be beneficial. So if you find pieces of our presentations that are I guess, beneficial for you to, to implement, that's kind of the whole idea here. It's just to spark conversation, share ideas, and provide a forum for discussion of what we're working on and where we're going. So what's in it for you? I, I kind of covered a little bit of this. It's it's just a, a better understanding of SOM infrastructure and how and why we do things and how this might apply to you or various projects that you work on. So to get into the details of vessel, there, there is some confusion out there whenever we came up with the word vessel. Um, it is not an acronym. It, it is vessel VESL. And this is our mainline business platform. Um, we, we have some, I guess, some core principles that guide us are just clean quality data, uh, trying to reduce the burden as much as possible for people that use our application and to be flexible uh, so that we can handle the various requirements that agencies need. And again, it's not an acronym. Uh, my wife actually came up with the name. It's just another, I guess, a, a clean, minimal uh, word that represents a container, or in this case, a, a vessel. And it's definitely relevant to the industry that we work in. And when we say vessel, it, it essentially includes our, our whole infrastructure and which has many different aspects to it. Um, we have our API, which is essentially like our core or the heart of everything. Um, it, it communicates, it makes communications between various platforms, processes, and of course, database, databases. Um, it is form or configuration driven. So um, many of you have worked with us and have heard us, uh, I guess, use the terminology of forms and each form could potentially represent like a say a set of requirements for a given client or fishery. And we have our different client applications. So we have web app applications, we have uh, a mobile application. And, um, and then of course, that those are what's really used to ingest a lot of the information from the industry and then pass it on to the core of vessel. And then of course we have uh, export processes. And these are typically processes that we use for transmitting data or transforming data from vessel to uh, external providers, such as the, the agencies that need the information uh, for stock assessments and other purposes. And then of course we have other resources for storage, storage events and monitoring. All right, and now to get into the, before we get into the meat of uh, content, I just wanted to see if anybody had any questions before we continue. What's fun is we have, since it's a little smaller group, we can definitely field some more detailed questions specific to you guys if you name yeah. as well. So, awesome. All right, so today's topic is on the rural engine. And the rural engine is configuration driven engine for handling validations, and user interface adjustments within Vessel. And so why build this? Um, we, I guess back in our old business model, when we had separate applications, it was very easy for us to just say programmatically hard code uh, validations or user interface adjustments directly in the application. And um, by moving to a centralized solution, you couldn't programmatically do that easily. So we transitioned into essentially building out database tables to try and handle or store the various requirements that were needed across agencies. And whenever we, we started growing Vessel and really maturing it, we realized that it was really needing to be adjusted again 
to a configuration driven uh, format that didn't require programmatic or database changes in order to make updates. Uh, because not only is it comp, I guess the various fisheries, not only do they vary in what the requirements are, we might release a set of requirements and then a month, six months or a year later, the requirements actually change. And so we have to make adjustments based on how people are using the system. Uh, maybe the regula regulations change and we have to make adjustments. So we, we essentially had to evolve the rule engine to be more flexible and uh, I guess less of a process to actually modify so that it can, it can be more future-proof. And so there, there are some basic because this is a break, basic breakdown of the rule engine. We have evaluation engines, and this tells us whether a value is required. So, uh, and I'll, I'll be getting into some I guess, examples to show you how all these pieces um, connect. But uh, some basic validation engines or evaluation engines that we have are required range and classification. So required might tell us like, hey, a value has been in, input input it into a field, a range might say, hey, that value must be between zero and 12. And therefore anything outside of that would trigger a validation event to where it's saying, hey, the value must be between this range. And then classification allows us to group different items uh, into something to say like, hey, this is an HMS species. And therefore when, when it's HMS species, certain fields or validations are required because of that. And so at, at the top, we have the evaluation engines that kind of tell us what we are evaluating. Uh, but then underneath that evaluation engine, we have different conditions to say, hey, it must meet this condition or it must meet that condition. And that's where you can see operators kind of come into play. It's saying, hey, are we talking about, hey, it needs to be this, this, and this, or is it, hey, it's this value, or it's that value, or it's this value, and then it's valid. And, and at the very end, we have the outcomes, which are our triggers to say, is this a validation to say, hey, that value must be between zero and 12, or is it simply a valid, a, a visibility thing to where it says like, hey, if this is an HMS species, then this field must be visible or not. And so to get in some, some more specifics, this, these are some of the examples that we have We've talked about uh, requiring a value, we've talked about how values might be able to fall within a certain range, but we've also come across scenarios where we have to restrict a value to a certain format. And commonly that is for say, a Coast Guard reg registration number or a state registration number. Uh, a lot of times agencies, we, or at least the requirement is that we can't just allow somebody to type in any, any value, we need to be very specific on what that value is. And so we have a different engine uh, I think it's an engine mm -hmm. uh, for determining a, a specific format of, of value. And then of course we get into some more advanced rules, which involves overlaying requirements of other agencies and then triggering those requirements based on whether it is permanent by that agency or if it's a certain species. Um, one example of this is if I, I am a commercial dealer in the state of Louisiana, I have to abide by the state, the state requirements, and then also the federal requirements if I purchase certain species. Uh, another common example that we've had to, to account for are uh, a field requirement based on when I'm actually filing a report. And so uh, there are certain times where a, a deadline might have passed and I'm filing a report or a late report uh, it, the agency wants a potential uh, scenarios when the agency wants to know why I am filing that report uh, as, as late as I am. But then the last scenario I want to talk about is uh, how we actually drive filtering based on our rule engine. And so in that example where I'm a commercial dealer in Louisiana, uh, whenever I'm buying certain products, the agency wants to restrict how that product is, is bought. And in, in a way, they, they want to make sure that I'm not selecting invalid combinations such as shrimp and fins for a grade. And since certain combinations just don't apply, 
And so we actually use the rule engine to drive the filtering to make sure that the values presented are actual valid combinations. And I'll be showing some examples of what this looks like in Vessel. And that's all dependent upon the agency to tell us what, what they're looking for. Right. So what the, what the correct combinations are. So here, this kind of jumps into uh, some JSON, and this actually is a snippet from an actual rule that lives in Vessel. And so you can see at the very top, this is the title of the rule, and this is what is displayed to the user. Uh, it, it's a simple validation rule that says that trip start is required. And you can see off to, uh, we have an engine, uh, oops, sorry, engine, it is a required engine. We have one condition, which actually specifies what field we are looking at, and then the trigger being a, a block save validation. And so what this means is whenever we, if a value is not present in the trip start field, then, and I'm trying to save that, validation will be blocked before and I would have to um, satisfy uh, satisfy the rule by entering in a value for the start date. All right, now we open for questions and um, if not, I'll, I'll dive into some examples. Yeah, we can we can show some examples on there or um, if you have any questions, I know the previous slide with the exact the, with the example that Andrew had, like you said, that actually came directly from um, one of our legitimate form configurations on our um, agencies, and so there's some things on there that um, may be specific to that form, like the field reference. So in, in Vessel, all of, our, all of our fields are referenceable by some background code value. Um, the idea being we would have a field on the form. Um, in that case, it was the trip start mm -hmm. field. Um, and we've had situations before where we'll have it out and then uh, an agency wants to adjust the nomenclature or what they're calling that field over time. Um, and so because of that, we want to always be able to, to update the name without having to go and update a rule because we're referencing it by name. And so we've in the background coded all of those fields with some internal value. Um, and then separately, there were also the long strings of um, digits and characters. Um, the code values that were displayed on some of those um, are called um, GUIDs or unique identifiers. And they are mainly, those are really only used for us internally um, whenever we push new rules up or even the same rule back, it uses those code values recursively to determine, oh, I know this code because it's the one I already have in the database and then it applies an update instead of if it's a new code, then it creates a new rule. Um, so all of these, all of these rules that we have are actually, um, they are recursive and they are updatable. So we can push and push an implementation of it up um, to our backend run it, you know, go through demos, have a client test it, see if it's if it's what they're looking for. And if it's not make adjustments and push that same, um, the same rule information up, but with the modifications and it will update in place. Um, the, I guess another one to call out is on the, the validation. So triggers, we have a various number of triggers um, available to us. And so on this one, it's a validation trigger, um, a validation outcome. And so, Rules are basically evaluated such that it checks the checks the evaluation of the rule completely. And in this case, this is a simple rule, so it only has conditions. It's not nesting into recursive sub rules, which can be um, entertaining. The whenever it checks the value, it's basically checking to see if um, if the rule is satisfied, and if so, then it doesn't fire the triggers. So in this case, the condition is that the trip departure date and then you refer to the engine is required. So if it has a value, then it's true and it won't fire any triggers. Um, so if this field did not have a value, it would. Um, so for our validation trigger, we support a few different operators. We have block save, which means um, we typically save that for when a value just does not make sense. And for us, we have really two fields explicitly that um, we usually always require, and that would be what the reporting entity is. And so for us, depending on the form, like for um, Sarah for hire, their reporting entity is the vessel. 
And so for us, we have a block save validation that the vessel is required because it makes no sense for someone to create a report without a vessel picked on that form because it's a report for a vessel. Um, so we, we use that for a lot of validations to block, or not for a lot, for a few validations to block things that just don't make sense. And then we use block submits code. So we really try to be um, un unintrusive as much as possible when we can with these validations. So we, we don't just continuously show them errors as they're occurring on the form and until they click save or submit. And then we'll show them the errors because um, you know, it's annoying for a user to be filling something out and seeing errors popping up and going away. And they're like, I've not even had a chance to put this in right. Um, so we hide validations until the end, as well as they might have done something on the report and they hit save. We'll, we'll allow it to actually get saved into the system and be pulled up by other users. So it is saved, but it's, it won't be able to support submitting. Um, that's the other operators like a block submit. So they can save it and then come back to it later and make fixes and adjustments and talk to a port agent to determine what changes they need to make if that's necessary. Um, but it will allow the record to be saved but not submitted. But the in really depending on the form, we also have that block submit or, or block save rule for when it's just really wrong. Um, and then warnings. We also have some warnings for if um, someone's trying to create a report like a year into the future. Um, not no, that one's not a warning. That's a or, block saver. Or at, at midnight, sometimes they. The agency wants the user to change away from, say, the default value of like a midnight. Yeah. Like, are you really sure you left at 12 o'clock and not 6 a.m., which right. is usual? Yeah. Um, and so some, sometimes it's this looks fishy, but we're not sure it's invalid. Yeah. Or well, the agency wants to, to prompt the user just to ensure that they are submitting what they should be submitting. Mm -hmm. And just generally, it's like rare case scenarios where this potentially could happen, but uh, they just want a confirmation from the user to say, yes, this is this is truly accurate, mm -hmm. uh, proceed with the submission. Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess that was um, one of our simplest rules right there. Um, does anyone have any questions on specific, um, I guess, what things we can do or how certain things might look like? Um, what ways certain some of these rules are actually implementing for uh, your use case? It is really quiet. Everyone's on mute right now. If not, we can jump into some more, I guess, of a demo and show you guys how how the rule engine works with the C fire form that we built up in the southeast. Pam unmuted. Yeah, I did. Um, so this is um, upon entry that you get, but well, when you save, you get the messages if something just doesn't validate correctly. Um, and then when you go to submit it, does it also do validations at that point or am I getting ahead of myself here? You're right. You're we, right. Do, we do validations with any with any checkpoint operation on a report. So if a user is saving it, that will do a validation, but then we also run validations when they submit it. Um, so that way we can make sure that something hasn't changed or, or, or been modified that we didn't necessarily realize. And so we do we do form a validation anytime that um, an, a modification is requested to a report and that does include submission. Okay, so it, um, I guess because we were talking about the date and time sailed, um, so do it in the end, it would actually go when you hit submit, it will go and look at previously submitted trips and say, this overlaps a previously submitted trip. We do have, so one of our evaluations engine is a, is an intersect engine, um, is an intersecting engine. So with that, we do have the ability, um, to say this field indicates the start range of time and this field indicates the end range of time for this field, which is the entity in this, in, in that case, it'd be like the vessel and say, does this intersect another trip? Um, so yes, we do, we do support that. We actually do, would run that validation on every save, um, on every save of the report. And we can use that to, um, we can use that to block save. I think there's actually a report where they wanted that a uh, form where they wanted that to be blocking the initial okay. save. So it's, a, it's very common with uh, making sure that a vessel is only on one trip at a time. Um, 
because yeah, I mean, we've seen that again and again where somebody will accidentally select a date either too far in the past or too far in the future um, and overlap multiple reports, which essentially invalidates that report. But yeah, we actually had one this week where someone all of a sudden they were receiving that validation on was it the zero form? We had the intersecting issue, the overlap. Uh, I believe it was, I believe it was the Sarah form, but I don't think it was, but they, they, had, they had it selected a date in 2020 on a new report. They had accidentally selected a 2020 date. And so that ended up then blocking any change to reports or anything they were doing to, um, to do submissions on reports in between them, because now it's, it's overlapping. Yeah. Um, so we had to go hunt down because they were trying to look for a report that might've been created that far back and going to the report list and we're going back like three months, six months, a year, but it had actually been like three years ago that they had picked the date. Um, <laughs> and so the message would be, they would get a specific message that says this overlaps another trip or something like that. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's actually a warning. Um, I know in some of the commercial uh, programs that we have for the dealer side, they, they want to present a warning whenever a fisherman has already been out on a fishing trip. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like we've been talking more on kind of the recreational side with the vessel reporting, but sometimes there that same scenario exists in, on the dealer side when they want to make sure that, hey, this you already have a report filled out for, with this fisherman on it. Are you sure that you want to continue with another report for that fisherman for that same day? Mm -hmm. Because the scenario, scenario can happen when a fisherman goes out in the morning to go fishing, they, they come in, they sell a catch, and then they go out later that that afternoon and do the same thing over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, no worries. Any, yeah, any questions you have on that? It's, it's this is a, definitely an ex, a part of Vessel that I really like a lot um, because I was, I originally came in, thankfully after the initial implementation where originally it was in that middle stage that Andrew had shown where the um, validations were more field driven. So like any type of new validation that needed to be implemented, there'd be like a new column on a database table for the fields on a form that would say like this field has a minimum value, maximum value. Um, and so introducing new validations or, or, or things were just difficult um, because they, they would require ending up with a database change. And we, that was one of the changes I brought in in my first year was was the rule engine allowing it to be um, not just defined on a field, but like really allow us to have one or many conditions with recursive support so that you can make very complex situations um, for evaluation. Uh, and the rule engine has been able to grow and adapt to the various uh, scenar new scenarios that we come across. I mean, uh, Garfo, you guys have, have a requirement to where if somebody's filling out a report, they have to be authenticated with Fish Online. And so we actually use our rule engine to ensure that that authentication is valid and accurate before we allow the submission of that report. Yeah. And so the, the rule engine it built in this, I guess, being con config driven allows us to expand it to other new scenarios that we hadn't actually originally planned for just because this whole concept can work where we have engines and we have conditions and then you can nest uh, rules within rules and um, so it's allowed us just to essentially create new rule and or yeah new new evaluation engines and then um, the system kind of adapts to the, the new needs. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you talked about um, how the vessel trip report actually is talking to the dealer reports. Is that something that's happening right now? Um, we are getting very close to being able to like do cross validations. I wouldn't say that we're there today and we have scenarios, but that has come up in the past of where we have in the state of Maine, we have um, our harvesters that are reporting in the vessel and then we also have dealers reporting in vessel and so the ability to start comparing reports between the two and determining how they line up is definitely feasible mm -hmm. uh, that's something that we we are uh, looking for i believe i believe what she was referencing is when you were discussing some of our state 
dealer reporting applications in Vessel. Um, yeah, it's it. He was he was he was just mentioning that we do have dealer reporting in Vessel occurring um, where we are running validations and they want you know certain warnings, but that's different than our our trip reporting for actual Vessel trips. Um, okay. <laughs> the word Vessel can be a confusion. Well, so the reason I was asking that is because there's a lot of compliance issues happening when um, a vessel submits their daily trip report scallop, for instance, and then they um, sell to a dealer down in Gloucester and that dealer reports it as one dealer report, one purchase. So it doesn't actually match back to any specific trip report. They may put one of the EVTR numbers in their dealer report, but then the poundage doesn't match. So if they have three scallop trips, 200 pounds each, you know, they have three EVTRs with 200 pounds on each one of them. And then the dealer gets it down in Gloucester and creates one dealer report for 300 pounds and only puts one EVTR number in. So any kind of validation on that is, it's just extremely difficult. Does the dealer report there capture a start and end time of like the full, the full period of trip for the vessel or only like the transaction time? Uh, what is it? It's, well, most of them is reported through SAPIS and I think it's just, I have to look. Um, it, nope, they just uh, ask for, uh, date landed and date of purchase okay. and yeah. when they put in a date landed most of the time they just put in the same date as the date purchased so now i do know that i do know on the vtr they they all they select a dealer they offload it to correct yeah whenever they do that and so that's i mean that's interesting for us so i, I do like finding out or i do like you know it's one of the reasons I really wanted to start having this, this series as well as discussing things like this, you know, requirements or issues that are out there because I am, I'm, a, I'm an IT guy, I'm a tech guy, I don't, <laughs> don't do fisheries, but if I know about something, I can help with it in time. Um, yeah. Like knowing if a, if, if a boat is going out and they're selecting dealers that they offload to, then, you know, maybe at some point we can show like, hey, you've got these unlinked EVTRs that, you know, that these harvesters are selected for you, which report do you want to link them to? And, right. um, you know, start producing some, some interesting validations there, or at least help for it. Mm -hmm. Could be, yeah. I mean, it could be as the dealers filling out their report, it's like what VTR, because you have these three that are, you know, pending. Yeah. Well, in, in, and I guess in an ideal world, the dealer should be submitting three dealer reports, one for each trip not just for one purchase they should be purchased you know each for a trip i guess i don't i mean that would just be ideal for a matching purpose but um i i can't get the dealers to do to be on board with something like that it happens a lot with lobster too when they call when they car their lobster so mm -hmm. but. so to show you guys just some examples, I guess, of how this actually works. I, I pulled up our development environment for Vessel and went to the CFIRE form. And the CFIRE, the CFIRE form is used by for hire captains uh, from Texas to North Carolina. Yeah, I think that North, Texas, North Carolina that have a reporting obligation to zero office uh, in the Southeast of the US. And here we, we pull up and kind of like what James was talking about earlier, like. A lot of our forms have some, I guess, very fundamental fields that are required. And for Seafire, that's the vessel and a trip start date. And so if I try to submit this or save this right now, it, it wouldn't allow it. Um, but once I select the vessel, you can start seeing how fields appear. And this is all driven by the, um, the rule engine. So Seafire uh, has I would say kind of two sets of requirements. It, it depends on if you are in the Gulf of Mexico or in the South Atlantic, your requirements will vary. And so that's why whenever we first pull up the, re the report, there aren't many fields because we don't know what boat is being reported for. So if I switch this back over to a South Atlantic boat, 
you'll see the requirements look very different where it just pops up the whole pretty much the whole report and then i can go through and we can fill out the report because they don't have a declaration requirement right because in the south atlantic there is no declaration requirement whereas in the evolve they do and declaration being they have to mail out or specify that hey i'm going on a fishing trip this is the daytime i'm leaving i intend on fishing uh this is the actual start time we say we we are leaving at 1 p.m and we are going to come back at say 5 p.m and landing location and again in the south atlantic they don't have to specify when they're going out south atlantic they just have to report once the trip is over and so here now that I've filled out this top section, we call this the declaration. And whenever I hit save, this actually sends out a notification uh, from them. You're uh, being logged out. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Log back in. It took too long in the presentation. All right, let's go back to. Gulf vessel. Gulf vessels. Captain, yes, we intend on fishing. We are going to be fishing today at 1 p.m. and we're going to come back today at 5 p.m. And we plan on landing here. And so I save, and this actually submits, sends out a, a notification um, through ACCSP to law enforcement to let let them know that I'm going on a trip and this is when I plan on coming back. Not from the well, yeah, not, <laughs> not from the development environment, but in production. Yeah, that's how this works. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And it gives a trip number, it's been saved, I can leave, I can come back and pick up where I left off. And before they actually unload, and again, this is in the Gulf of Mexico, before they offload that fish, they have to come in here and complete the report before they are finished. And so uh, in the very top right corner, you can see was their fishing effort. Um, sometimes a trip might start, but then have to end early due to bad weather, due to somebody getting sick. And then if they they don't have to, uh, if they don't have effort, they don't have to fill out as much information as if they do have effort. So we'll go in. We'll say the trip ended right on time. We came back at 5 p.m. And this is probably going to yell at me because I'm doing this in the future. But that's okay. Again, this is all driven, all the, the validations, the uh, filtering, the user interface adjustments, all are driven by that, that uh, full engine. And I'll enter in a couple invalid values here. And, and then we can always show what some of those look like, what some of those validations look like. Um, Michelle is on here. Michelle, do you have any questions? I know since we're kind of using your form as the, uh, the test, demonstration. Um, I do not have any questions. I'm actually multitasking and testing the things that you recently changed. I'm actually on this whole button where you select no effort right now on the app, but I'm using my phone, so it looks obviously a little bit different. I am drafting an email and I will be sending my comments <laughs> shortly, okay. but it looks great. Thank you. No worries. It sounds like me. I'm usually doing five things at once. Unlikely. And so here you see, um, like I had mentioned, it, it would yell at me because I'm not allowed to submit this, this information until uh, I'm within two hours of the end. Um, so here we have this validation. We have fishing hours must be greater than and less than 100. And therefore, I can, I can change this back to five, hit save. And another, another error that or warning that you see here is no catch have been added to this trip. So again, this is one of those validations that uh, agencies want to have some type of notice to say, hey, this, you might have forgotten this, but you might not have, like, are you sure? And this and is, if you should, if you hit no, it was, was there no fishing effort? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so actually I can, I can go ahead and change the end time to be closer, let's say 1 p.m. That should allow me to uh, bypass that. I have to do 101. Not one. <laughs> Save. And now you can see. And and Pam, this kind of gets your to your point of like, 
I, I wasn't able to submit until I fixed some of those um, block submit validations, but now I'm able to submit. Um, and this is what actually hits the error. If, I'm sorry, hits the server. If there is a warning, it, it pops up with a confirmation just to say, hey, I, I, I confirm that these values are valid before proceeding. And there are some rules that can only be done by the server. And so like a submission rule, like what we were talking about with the overlapping trips um, on the client side here, we don't necessarily have every single trip that a, a vessel has taken. And so sometimes there is like a server validation that, that needs to be run just to make sure it, it meets all the requirements before it allows it to pass. Yeah. Any of our any of our evaluation engines that we can implement locally, so those are typically within the scope of a report, um, are typically done both server and client side. And then as Andrew was mentioning, we have we do have an intersect engine so that, that tracks overlapping reports for web. Since web only works in the context of one report and it's online, it doesn't have that other list of reports. So it it does have it does rely on the server to block that because that's what the server is there for. Um, mobile actually does run that evaluation locally, but mobile might not have all the reports. So it's still every every time the operation is done on the back end, the back end always reasserts it. And then that way, in case someone does manage to somehow meddle with their local, um, like with the the website locally and force something through, um, which if you're if you're really good with um, technology, you know, is, is somewhat rudimentary to do. That's why we have all of those redundant on the back end. So we're not just relying on that front end validation. We are separately validating on the back end as well. Cool. Um, does anyone have anything specific that they'd like to potentially see? Yeah, we have a number of scenarios. So if, if y'all throw up a, a scenario, we might have it covered. All good. No worries if not. Okay. Ready, guys? Are you going to show me a um, Northeast lobster trip, maybe? Sure. <laughs> name, name form. Doesn't work on. Okay. Oh, which doesn't. So that that is the one problem. So our web client is not um, see. compatible yet with what is necessary for reporting on certain forms. So like Sarah form is is simple because it's um, some header information and then one nesting section where you capture multiple values for it. So that's the details, the catch um, for. Our one form that currently is in production gathering that information, it has multiple nests of values. So you have your header information, then underneath that it's effort information, and then underneath that it's catch information, then I think underneath that is offload information. Um, web is not supporting that at this time. We actually are working on that. That's actually something that we're hoping to make good progress with this next year. We're also unifying our efforts between our web and mobile um, so that we won't have that type of um, disparity in the future. But Andrew is going to try. Yeah, I'm going to pull it up. So this is actually a good a good uh, time to show the mobile app and how again mobile app uses the same backend infrastructure. Uh, we use that same core concept, um, the, the, that being the ABI. So we have multiple clients that we use depending on how users want to enter in information. Some find it easier. They're on the go. They want to do it via mobile app. Some are more like data entry player, and they want to. Um, sorry, I just have to get uh, logged in here. Some some are on a computer every day, and so it's easier for them to to uh, get in and enter in the reports on their computer. All right. So now that I am about to be authenticated. Get in. I can move move around the vessel application, and we'll see what form I might switch forms. Mm -hmm. I'll say it's AGFC right here. Uh, I guess AGFC is the first one. I didn't mean to make you have to do this. <laughs> this no, this is good. All right, so let's go over to the state of Maine. We have the Maine Harvester report. So this is going to be a, a good example of, of what you asked for. And you'll oh. see that there's 
Yeah, you can you can start with it. This one is in the middle of some readjustment of, of requirements, but I think it will actually still function. Okay. Um, it just won't be able to submit right now. So here, here we have three primary screens. We have the prime report, create report, and create uh, a did not fish report. We'll jump in and we'll just create a positive report. And you'll see that this form is a bit more complex than the CIFAR form in that there's a lot of nesting to be done because uh, in Maine, you, you fill out a report, a report header, you say, hey, I, I landed on this date. I am buying from this fisherman. Oh, no, this is the fisherman filing the report. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is the fisherman that's filing the report, uh, and this is the vessel that I took out. And this is actually a federally permanent vessel. So we'll say we left this morning at 6 a.m. and we are coming back at 12 p.m. The port I landed at is this one. We have a trip type of commercial. Through. And you, you can still see here that the roll engine still applies. Um, like if I select a different trip type charter in this case, you see number of anglers appears. Whereas if I flip back to commercial, again, it's showing and hiding those fields. So now number of anglers is no longer available. We click number of crew. We have a trip activity of fishing trip with effort. We hit continue. And so that's the basic information for a top level, the trip information that's needed. And then we can dive into the fishing effort for each. And that was at the point that it it generated the VTR number. Yes, yes. If you saw that at the top of the screen, it generates that VTR number once once you save the header. And so here again, uh, the requirements vary based on the gear that's selected, and so that's why you only see gear top at the top, at gear at the top. And now you said lobster, so I should yep. probably select a lobster trip or lobster trap. This PTL. PTL. Uh, so it's deactivated. Yeah, I was going to say, here we go. Lobster pots and traps. And so there, there you get a whole bunch of new fields to add uh, for lobster. So we're entering just some values, go count five gear sets, set time, hours five. Sea time five, and then we have a fishing location that needs to be selected. So you can put a pin down. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the, in the pin, we'll find the area it belongs to, or do you have to find the area as well? For you mean that area? Yeah. Um, so we've actually talked with Garfo in, in Maine about doing that in the future of where once you select a lat long, it automatically populates the stat area. Um, I forget the reason why we didn't right off the bat. I think it might have just been timing, trying to get trying to get everything ready. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for the time being, uh, we just have separate, separate selections. I like this. And then once we once you fill out all the effort information, then you start specifying the species for that effort. So we'll do lobster. Pounds. Food. And then you then you get to do the offloads within within each species. And uh, Maine actually has the, the offloads nest the catch to specify, whereas uh, the Garfo form actually has that offload section as a separate separate section. And then we'll do sold to dealer. If it's sold to dealer, you have to specify. Again, this is the rule engine in action, uh, evaluating what values are be being selected and then adjusting the requirements based on what, what is selected.
And just with surely how much the form changes as you're going through it, you can just tell how many different scenarios the application has to be able to handle. And so that's why I, you you multiply that by multiple clients and multiple needs, and it just like it gets very complex very quickly. And one thing I didn't actually mention in, in the presentation I'm into is we actually some of the scenarios can get so complex that we actually had to write something to help us read our own <laughs> engine. It's just because this, this scenario, the scenario, the tree of decisions that it has to make can be so complex, and reading that in, in code can be complex even for those of us that have some of a tech background. And so this the script that we have it literally just reads it, it, it parses it out into English formatted document that you can just like read through and understand what it's doing. And that's come in handy for us whenever we're trying to look and identify an issue. And say, hey, what, what's the what's the output of this mm -hmm. role engine so that we can actually like understand what what's happening here. The, the rules between, you know, just Maine or states and Garfo and Southeast, and I can't even imagine that you guys <laughs> program to all those different things. It's amazing. You see, most people on our team are bald. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been around here for 24 years, and I, the, the rules are still like, make me think second thoughts is like seriously <laughs> dude i mean they've evolved uh, ever since we we uh, i guess officially got started in this industry the rules are so different and so the application has to be able to adapt and evolve to to the changing environments and i guess a couple of points i'd make too is we we try to write the rule engine to be as protective as possible um, so in the case that there is a problem or failure evaluating a, a, an evaluation, it will actually register that as a failure um, instead of a success and in that way. So if, there's, if there were some issue evaluating a situation, it typically immediately comes up in our, in our testing internally because we, we fail it. And so things end up getting blocked and it's like, okay, well, why is this blocked? And then we got to go dig into that. Um, so we're, we're protective on data from that aspect. And then we're also excited about some of our, our upcoming enhancements with it. So one of them, um, one of them that I'm hoping to get to within the next year or so um, will be uh, remote validations. And so like you were just saying, some of those validations that you end up interpreting or seeing are just uh, are difficult. Um, and sometimes they're not even, you know, we've, we've seen potentially um, validations before from some of our agencies where they kind of want us to like run it through their validations as well. And then they're like, okay, yes, that's a good, you know, that looks valid or no, that doesn't before we ever potentially accept it. And so one of the um, engines that we're going to end up making is a remote evaluation engine so that we would specify like an endpoint to hit. And whenever that report hits our server, our server will call out to a, to an endpoint that's specified and say like, hey, is this valid? And so we can actually start to offload certain more complex evaluations, depending on situation to, um, you know, third parties as they want to specify. And that may have more to do in terms of um, like inventory management. If someone's creating a report and it's like, hey, warning, you're getting close to your the max of your inventory. Um, it's just, it's extremely flexible and it's going to be exciting to see where it goes in the next year. Yeah, wow. Yes, yeah, so here, here's that report. Um, you can go ahead and save. I'm not sure this will submit in dev right now. <laughs> it might. It, 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 it's, it's interesting. Let's see. Oh, it will. If you did try to submit, to Andrew's point, if you did try to submit, it will actually, um, as long as it's not blocked, it will actually prompt for an authentication with Garpo because you didn't sign in with your Garpo account. Correct. Um, so let's see, let's see what it does. We do have we do have a single sign-on server that we all use for login, and whenever we are logging in, it um, it redirects us to our Microsoft account since we use uh, Microsoft, and so we sign in with that. Filing EBTRs for Garpo though requires authenticating with the Garpo Fish online, and so whenever he clicked submit on that, it determined he had not signed in and he didn't have a valid token with Garpo, and so now he's doing that. 
actually don't have credentials. Um, <laughs> luckily. Hey, do you want it. me to do you want me to give you some? <laughs> no, 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 no. But I'm just kidding. But, I don't want you to submit that trip report to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would yeah, I, I would assume this goes to dev for testing our yeah. So this so. this this right here is just getting the token and then after it's got the token it would go to our server push the report into a submitting status not a submitted status it once it hits submitting it's then um passed along to our backend infrastructure evented out to another backend service of ours that sees oh hey there's a report submitting for this form i need to um go send it to accsp for this instance um which then it would go but right now that service is not running in development and so it, you would not receive that, but you could authenticate. Yeah. It would just sit there in pending so submitting status forever. So if there was a federal, I guess that, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll just stop. No, 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 what is, go ahead. <laughs> so <clears throat> we currently do have federal lobster guys submitting trip reports, even though they're not required yet. Um, except because some of them do it because they have ground fish or whatever. So if they were logged into Vessel as because states requiring it right now, um, and they do have a fish online account, but they would be logging in under their state credentials. And then when they get to this submission point, if they, it would prompt them to log in through the fish yeah. online. Yes, so it would prompt them to log in. So Andrew doesn't actually have an account. So here you'd be able to go to create account and register one at this point. Okay. Um, so this would do a registration. You'd have to go through all of this. This really kind of interrupts the, that flow for this report. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and cancel this. I've taken over his presentation for the moment. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but so most of them do have fish online accounts because they have fish online accounts created to renew their federal permits. So they could just log in. They could just log in with their fish online credentials. And once they do that, it, this report would submit and then go through all those other places and get to ACCSP. Is that and what what's, e, I believe so, if I understood you correctly, yes. And not only that, if they had a fish online account to begin with, so let's say this, this is a user that just installed the vessel application and they already had a fish online. Whenever they go to create one, um, we actually do present that as an option. So they can register with Bluefin data or they can sign in with their fish online. Um, if they do this, sign in, it will actually create them a Bluefin account, link them to um, their fish online account within our system. And then whenever they come back to Vessel from that point on, if they put in their line email here it will actually already kick them out to fish online because it knows they don't have a bluefin it do, they don't have a bluefin password they could then set up a bluefin password um and then use either or but yeah we do fully support only using fish online for those situations to make onboarding a little easier for those users yeah and maintenance just because captains don't remember their password so one less password that they have to remember the better do i do what's one of your test accounts Tony? oh Anthony Spear login. Yeah, let me um best oh, vessel tester. So um per the no I don't know that I have a just user specific name. No, not name, just any general when I say the vessel tester oh. denominator. Um is that gonna work? Ah, it does. Okay, so this is an account that um that Tony our tester, Tony our tester, um has set up <laughs> and, yeah. And whenever he signed in, let me see, I'm guessing he he does not have a Garfo account linked to this. And so whenever I put in the username, it's like, okay, you only have a password set. And so it was asking the password on this screen. But separately, we actually also allow them to sign in with an email. And so this ends up sending them a link to that email address on record, which then they can click on the link and get signed in. So we we tried to greatly reduce the friction that we were seeing with sign-ins because um, a lot of a lot of the fishermen in that don't they're not um, you know in IT they are not as technically um, minded as as we are and so they they don't it's not in their mind to remember passwords and so we've tried to kind of reduce that and a lot of IT is actually kind of moving towards passwordless sign-ins. That's a great idea. <laughs> um, 
Sorry, I completely took that. But yeah, if you if you were interested in people being able to use the vessel account with like fish online and that it is it is supported. And then we also try and streamline other ways of um, doing that. Um, so even here, if they, you know, if Andrew had signed in with his fish online account, fish online, I've actually been working with, um, Garfo over the past, over the past, uh, few months with their open, um, with their single sign on implementation and they expire a user's sign in session after 45 minutes of inactivity. Um, internally for vessel, if a user signs in on the device, we don't want to keep signing them out because we have seen just two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we saw a user who um, there was two for the same um, trip company, vessel company that were sharing accounts, two different captains, and they were sharing one account. They would just pick their vessel, but one changed the password and didn't communicate it to the other one. The other one was trying to sign in and got frustrated and tried signing in like 40 times. So trying to reduce difficulty in signing in is, is definitely on our list of priorities to do because we already know a lot of the users are frustrated with reporting in general. And so we try to make reporting as simple with the rule engine to reduce like, okay, you don't have to fill out these fields because they aren't even pertinent to you. So we just hide them with the rule engine. But then we also do that with, with sign in like, hey, we know it's hard to remember passwords. You can sign in with your email. Yeah, I, re I have to help people with usernames and passwords all the time. And you're right, most of them are not electronic savvy. Most of the main guys still have flip phones. <laughs> really? Main? Like, uh, main? That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Flip phones. That's, well, I remember when I, whenever I was up there, like, it was it's body service. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you're in. I'm just thinking of the NFC Yeah, they really have a hard time with the internet. Yep. And um, service, cell phone service. Yeah, a lot of locations, the islands out there. So this is this is going to be a lot of fun for these guys. I'd say it's beautiful up there, but it's, it's very remote. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions? Or any other things you have, Andrew? No. No. Covered a lot of ground. Okay. Well, thank you guys for joining. Yeah. Thank you. This was uh, very helpful to me. Awesome. We'll, we'll be sending out a, a, another notification of our next one. Right now, the statute. Wait, yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.